beautiful people. We have one of the most famous people in poker, one of the most beloved figures in the poker worlds. Basically, I think what I do really well is I communicate advanced concepts in a way that breaks it down so that people can understand. If you're better than your opponent, I think you absolutely should be making making reads. Obviously the recent Berkey stuff. I mean, I did make one tweet that obviously Berkey's not a scammer. And I even got backlash for that. <laughs> How um, dare you? <laughs> You'll always be looked to for arbitrations. I think in some ways that aspect of me is overvalued by the poker community. I don't think I'm a better arbitrator than a bunch of other people. What's your percentage that telepathy could be a real phenomenon? Can you define telepathy? Yeah, I feel differently about him than I feel about anybody else uh, in the world. I don't know the worst excitable, passion driven. Like I, I, I want to do something different every year, like or every few months. I'm like, I have a great idea. I want to do this now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, beautiful people. We have the one, the only one of my, I'm going to say idols. I don't like that word. I don't really mean it, but one of the people that I looked up to so much when I was younger, growing up in poker and uh, one of the most beloved figures in the poker worlds himself. What's up, Phil? How's it going? That's very kind. Yeah. What's it like being, uh, what, like the fourth most, third most famous Phil in poker? <laughs> like being one of the most famous people in poker. Yeah, it's a little, uh, it's a little brutal, but I don't mind it. I don't mind it. I mean, before I was well known that all the Phil's were already well known. I knew, I knew it was an uphill battle. And I'm, I'm working my way through them. You know, one of, one of my first memories of you, obviously you've had this, this training website and I never watched any training websites apart from a little bit of blue fire, mm -hmm. it's like proper back in the day stuff, this, yep. and I just remember there was a spot where you, I think you defended big blind, button it open, small blind called you defended big blind and you just led trash on like seven, seven deuce rainbow. And I've been using that play for about 11 years of my life and it still nice. crushes. <laughs> awesome. I didn't even remember that. Yeah. Yeah. It's one of, one of your finest moments in my life. at least. Nice. So yeah, I, we haven't really crossed paths much, you know, no, we haven't. Uh, I think we might've played a couple of times in Vegas or something along those lines. Um, but you've, you've just been in the sphere and you've been a very powerful influence and I I'm very intrigued by it. I'd like to hear kind of your perspective of how that happens because you're somehow unanimously known as the most fair person in the poker world. Like you'll always be looked to, I, I don't want to make comparisons of type or whatever, but you'll always be looked to for arbitrations. Your name will always be brought up if you were to be on a board of arbitrations or something like that. And people just really heavily that they, they deeply respect what you, what you have to say. And I'm curious how you think that you've garnered such a unique image in the poker world. Yeah, I mean, I think I'm, I think in some ways it's, uh, that aspect of me is overvalued, uh, by the poker community. I don't think I'm a better arbitrator than a bunch of other people. I think, I think I've kind of developed, so because people have watched my training videos for so long and basically I think what I do really well is, um, communicate my thoughts. And so I communicate advanced concepts in a way that breaks it down so that people can understand. And I think because of that, people just think I'm, I don't know, clear headed. And they, they think that I have something intelligent to say about everything, which is not entirely true. I think, I think just what the skill is, is communicating my thoughts into words that, that everybody can understand. And so I think that gives them maybe a skewed perspective of, um, yeah, my, how, how, clear I will be on making decisions and, and how thoughtful and, uh, logical I will be in making decisions. And I mean, I, I'm a thoughtful person. I try hard when, you know, give, given the job of, of arbitrator, but I don't know. I don't think I'm, I make better decisions than, than anybody like th not than anybody than a lot of other people. <laughs> I'm going to add on to that because I feel like there's more, I feel like there's a deeper part of it. And I think it's something along the lines of you've been in the spotlight for so long with the platforms that you've created, had a very successful business, obviously. And I can't think of a single time where you've let your ego get out of control when handling yourself online and you've wanted to attack somebody or hurt somebody or undermine somebody or even just like the, the smallest inconvenience to their life. I feel like you, you've been analytical 
you know, it's not like you're a wet flannel, but it's like a, a fairness behind that, that I think people, people, even if they don't consciously recognize it, it is palpable. Yeah, I mean, you actually, I think, hit the nail on the head of something that is kind of deep, uh, that, that, that kind of is the way that I lead my life, uh, or kind of a, a strong belief of mine is I, I never want someone's experience with me to make their day worse. Um, and I think that I've I'm not saying I've, 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 I'm not saying I've succeeded hundred percent of the time, but that's kind of a, one of the first thing, one of the first filters that, uh, my thoughts go through in my mind before they turn into actions. Is there a part of you that is able to say something very direct and honest that, you know, might hurt another person? Is that a part of you that's kind of honed? Um, I, I, I mean, I don't know. I think that there are, I, I, I think direct and honest is, is really valuable in a lot of relationships, including, especially working relationships. I, I guess at times I'm able to be direct. I feel like I've found it at work because I realize how inefficient it is to not be direct. Yeah, yeah um, too, man. I tried that. And occasionally in my personal life, but for the most part, you no, know, I would, I would word things very carefully in, in hopes of not upsetting somebody. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a fine balance to it. Like, you know, if somebody comes to you for advice and they happen to be like in an abusive relationship, there's yeah. a part of you that needs to be, that needs to say, actually, you know, what they have done is abusive, knowing that that will probably really hurt the person that, and there's going to be a million other iterations and, and examples of that. Yeah, for sure. And I also want to say, I don't think that the way that I'm leading my life, I don't think that that's <laughs> right. Um, I think it's just kind of who I am. Um, and I think you're a good example of somebody who uh, is, you know, a lot more likely than I am to, to speak up uh and sometimes to speak against somebody who's who's doing harm to other people and that basically i think by being we'll just call it nice um yeah. i avoid doing some good uh, as well but i i just i don't know that's who i am i think you're you definitely are nice but i think you're also kind and i think that that's that's something that's a, a very big distinction because there's a lot of nice people that when it comes down to the deepest parts of their life, they probably have a lot of skeletons. They probably have, have a lot of things going on. They might be abusive in certain circumstances and the nice is kind of a cover up. And I, I never get that, that feeling from you. Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you. I mean, I think I, I don't know. I've, I've led a very lucky life. Um, and I think, you know, um, there was a time, so, Recently, uh, so a couple of years ago, my dad passed away suddenly and it was the first real loss that I've ever had. And I remember, um, like the, yeah, close to home loss like that, that I've ever had. And, um, I was talking to Jason Kuhn about this, uh, because I had noticed that over the, like in this, in the six months following it, I had, a um, like a shorter temper than I ever had. And I was saying to him, you know, I thought that I thought that I kind of was even tempered just because that's how I was born. And uh, he was he's somebody who's worked on yeah, like, so anger management all of his life because and, and he was like, no, man, it's it's yeah, it's it's based on what you experience. And I think basically, yeah, I think I've had a, a very easy life um, and I that that has made me even tempered. I don't have. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not battling, uh, anything internally that, that a lot of people have to battle. How emotive are you? Like how much do you cry or laugh with joy or whatever? It's funny. Cause I, I consider myself very emotional, but not emotive. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I mean, I, I laugh a lot. I, I don't cry almost ever. I basically though, I, I can cry pretty easily at like a tv show yeah, yeah, yeah. uh but for things in in real life 
it's, I don't know. I can think of like a couple times maybe. Um, so yeah, it's more, and I don't know, really know what that is, but I'm not, I'm not emotive. I think, I think part of not being emotive comes from a, some of the same place that the kind of niceness or, or I don't want to be, I think it comes from a fear of judgment in a way. So one of, one of the only things I did deal with growing up was a lot of social anxiety and, um, assuming that people were thinking things about me that they weren't assuming that that conversations were going worse than they were. And I never wanted anybody to notice me. So there was a time where I had these, I made my mom, I was like eight. I made my mom buy me the same shoes. Like every time I got new shoes, cause I didn't want anybody to notice that I like had <laughs> wow. new shoes. So I think that not being emotive and being careful with the way that I speak, it's all kind of from, I don't want to do or say the wrong thing and have somebody judging me. That's beautifully uh, honest and uh, yeah, transparent. Have you dug into why eight year old you was like that? Like, was that some dynamic? I tried. And I mean, I've worked with, um, you know, I, I've done hypnotherapy. I've, I've, <laughs> uh, talked to psychiatrists. I don't, I, I haven't really found the, I haven't really found it. I haven't found it. But I, I've realized that it's, it goes back, like I can think of it back in when I was six is the earliest time I can remember. And I had, I don't know, I don't know why I did this. I just sharpened my pencil. I was in first grade and I sat down at my desk and I was looking at it and it poked me in the eye. And, um, and I was like, I couldn't, I couldn't not cry, but I was being silent and I didn't want to wow. tell anybody. And eventually my, my friend who sat across from me finally told my teacher and then I went to the nurse and then I had to wear an eye patch for a week or something, but I just didn't You're want to sit in there. Just stoic. Yeah. But yeah. I'm fine. <laughs> yeah. Wow, yeah. That's crazy. Is there, sorry, if you don't mind, this is kind of a really niche conversation, but I'm really fascinated because it, it has built up so much of who you are today. If, if, if yes. what you're saying is, is, is true. And, uh, is there like a, a pattern within your family, maybe from your father or your mother, where they're also very emotionally reserved when it comes to expression? My dad was very um, logical. He was not, he's not very emotional. We used to joke that he didn't have emotions. Um, so yeah, he was, yeah, he was kind of stoic. And did you look up to that in a way? I definitely looked up to him a lot, a lot of, and actually my mom was, um, I really like, like in hindsight, I really like what she did and I don't know how intentional it was, but she always spoke to me about the things that she admired in my dad and mm -hmm. you know, how hardworking he was and how honest he was and how kind he was. And I really wanted to be like him. And I think it shapes kind of, yeah, who I, um, how I kind of strive to present, uh, or yeah. be in the world. Um, so yeah, I, de I definitely look up to him. I don't re recall specifically admiring that he was not emotional, but I'm sure I, I'm sure it was subconscious and, you know, I wanted to be like him. Yeah. It's, it's interesting. I, I had a completely different, but also it led to similar way, similar path, um, way, way of growing up where I, I had a lot of kind of the classic traumas, uh, I don't know, I shouldn't say classic, but like big traumas that happened to me when I was pretty young. Um, <clears throat> and one of them was inclu including being bullied by everyone in the school, basically for years. And what that led to me doing was I realized that being emotional was just like the suboptimal play. It was like the nut low. It was, uh, you know, if you cry in front of the school, that's, that's when people pounce and that's when vulnerability is, is a weakness. And I, from that build up this defense mechanism, which in the psychiatric community, I'd probably look to the spiritual community for these things, but in the psychiatric community, they call it intellectualization, where you experience an emotion kind of cognitively, but you don't experience it physiologically, or, you know, you don't get the, the warmth in your heart or the, the gut wrenching feelings in your stomach anywhere near as much, at least. And it got to the extreme where when I was between the ages of 15 to 19, I was by all means, just a, an emotionless person. Like I, you could have literally told me I was going to die the next day and I would have laughed. 
that was and i i thought it was because i was the stoic nihilistic genius yeah of course how could i not be because i'm so above other people who have these silly emotions and <laughs> i dig into it many years later and it's like oh i was just traumatized yeah traumatized kind of smart and figured out all these rationalizations that weren't actually true of why why i was like that yeah that makes sense as you say that i mean i think i i think i've always felt the internal feelings that go with emotions. I just think I, I block them from being noticeable uh, to others, which I guess works well in poker. I was about to say, yeah, that's a, that's a brilliant <laughs> poker face. One, one yeah. of my spiritual teachers actually, she, she noticed that I had this like mask on and I didn't even know I had it. And it's because everyone in my family, instead of being like emotive with their facial expressions or anything like that, no, no, not much gesticulation either. Uh, I, I reflected that without knowing. And I, you know, also from the building, I, I just, whenever I'd feel anything, I just big smile, you know, and it would look real to a lot of people, but people who are like finely attuned to these things just saw straight through it in a second. And she thought it was like, is that what she asked? Like, is that to do with being a poker player? And I was yeah, like, I, I, I was talking so. to, uh, you know, Blake Eastman, who's like a uh, poker tell, he analyzes videos of people playing poker and, and just nonverbal, uh, whatever, nonverbal stuff yeah. uh and he uh he's a friend and he told me one time he was watching i think he was i i was it was a final table that i won and i was you know posing with the bracelet yeah. and all that and he told me that my fake smile is extremely genuine mm -hmm. and i think it's probably i think i my dad smiled a lot too i think it was just uh i was often uncomfortable um and anxious and just <laughs> yeah it reached your eyes there i saw that's how you that's how you know it's a real smile if it reaches their eyes so you have to like kind of do this mini squint thing if you want to yeah. do a good fake smile, you go. <laughs> yeah yeah i feel that and so I, I, i'm curious i'm curious speaking of life tells what's your exploration of life tells because it's something i've gone uh, down the rabbit hole with and Honestly, I haven't um, explored it much. There was a time actually when I first met Blake that I was trying to pay a lot of attention to it. And I found it because I almost all of my play is online. I found it. It was just, I just had cognitive overload. I was trying to keep track of what everybody was doing physically, but I also have to count the pot and like yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, keep my body still and, and work my chips. Um, I just got overwhelmed, to be honest. And so there, there have been times when I've like I still try to pay attention but I don't consider myself good with live tells at all. And I, I do believe there, there's a lot of value in it, but I, I haven't uh, been successful, I think. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wild one. Like I, I like to separate them into two categories. There's like the, the type where you sometimes just get a feeling, you know, mm -hmm. like the Patrick Antonio style of getting a live tell. He just, he just, I spent a lot of time playing against him live and he just gets a feeling sometimes. And he's got a very, very fine tuned feeling. And then there's the more kind of quantifiable or qualifiable, discernible, scientifically empirical tested things that yeah. you could have a huge sample of. And it turned for, for me, though, those are the ones that I'm, I'm particularly good at finding and utilizing. It turns uh, a hand that you might have, like, say, six data points preflop, you know, to actually yeah. flop or whatever, et cetera, into one where you might have like 15 if you're yeah. really paying attention. And there's very few people, in my opinion, in the world, in the poker world, that are paying that much attention. But there are there, those people definitely do exist. Like Phil Ivy, I've seen him play, and I've seen him play against some of the best in the world. And he just takes lines or makes hero calls that just aren't anywhere close to being a hero call. But his, his yeah. percentage of being right is is goddamn good. Yeah, yeah. I think one thing people uh, a misconception people have is that like once you are great at live tells, you just know what people have it's but it, no it just shifts the odds yeah. and it's tough. Favorite, it's tough. sometimes you get it completely wrong sometimes yeah. you think it means x and it means x over one or whatever and it's oh, sorry one over x and it's just uh you got you got to punt your way through life you know yeah you got to punt how did you find it how did you go about developing that in the first place there were one main strategy was just staring at people when I was in a hand, when I was out of hands, I got a lot of very angry people at me for it because I was literally just like, and I've done it, just staring at my laptop in front of my, and just finding specific things that were universal throughout everybody. 
that were <coughs> not easily controlled and not easily noticed that had a, a very high success rate of being an accurate tell. Mm -hmm. And over many, many, many years, just fine tuned that into there's, there's a few that everybody has that will happen multiple times throughout our hands, whether they like it or not. And if you can like utilize that into a specific, I'm not going to say formula, it's not that scientific, but just like, if you use those data points very, very, um, very powerfully or very correctly, it just, it, it, it's so crazy. I I've described it and people get annoyed at me for describing it like this, but it feels like you're almost playing an instrument because you can do certain things like pick up your chips to get a certain reaction from that from that person. And then that will then, okay, well, that takes out the top of their range, you know, something like that. And it really feels like you're in, if you're in that flow state, it really feels like you're negotiating, like massaging the person, the person's energy or something like yeah. that. Um, so yeah, it was, it was a lot of that. And then just a lot of thinking, like talking through with Ben Heath and saying, okay, so if we can make 30% more accurate river decisions in this spot, what line are we going to take on the flop? You know, are we going to turn our second pair into a check call instead of a C-bet? Probably. You know, are we, are we going to, you know, fold the next hand pre-flop because we have a higher edge against this person who's on our right or th higher three bet percent, three, three bet percentages that's going to be successful because we know when he's not at the top. It, the, the nuance of it is so beautiful. And it's, what, it's one yeah. of the things I love about poker is that the art of the psychology and the uh, mixed in with the maths. Yeah, I think, I mean, I, so like I said, I'm not good at live tells, but I, I, that speaks to me or resonated with me just from a, an online perspective, just like hand reading online. Like I just love going through every decision point and everything that I know about that person. Um, yeah, it's just really fun. I remember it's, it's weird that I just had this memory. It's like probably the first, probably like 10 plus years ago, but watching you play on probably blue fire mm -hmm. and seeing the, the note that you made and you just noted the whole hand history and it's something I'd never done. And I was like, well, and I tried doing it. I was just like, I can't even read it in time. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I was also trying to like 24 table and do it at the same time. But oh, yeah, I never, uh, I could never mass table because so many of my plays were just, yeah, reads. I mean, I, so when I go through, a lot of people think that I'm just like, that I wouldn't describe any of it as an art, but I think there is an art to it. And I think some of it's uh, like when I, when I'm playing a heads up match, Assuming I have time after every session, um, I just go in hold a manager filter by saw showdown and I just like, just kind of zone out and look at every hand that they played that I saw there, sh that I saw showdown because it just gives me a feel for, I think how they think. Um, that's yeah, it's really, it's really um, interesting that I, I'm not I've like seen... taking notes. I'm not taking notes. I'm just, yeah, just, yeah, you're just feeding the intuition. Yeah. yeah. I, I always have a thing like I need to see the end of a hand history. Sometimes people will be like, oh, I'm not going to give you the result because like, all right, I'll give you my opinion. I need to see what they had because I've got to, <laughs> yeah. I've got to feed the database, you know, I've got to, <laughs> I've got to add to it. And, um, so I, I watched, uh, maybe all, not, maybe not quite all, but most of the match you've had against jungle playing heads up. I've seen the, the mix and you've taught me a lot about heads up here. Though, thanks. There, by the way. Uh, I've seen the mix of logic and intuition and you're very very good at making a, a good like explaining the duality between you know here's my intellect here's my intuition here's where i'm going to go with my intellect here's where i'm going to go with my intuition um and i think that it's very difficult for a lot of people to comprehend that that is a duality a lot of people like to i'd say a lot of the top players like to poo poo the intuition and a lot of perhaps some weaker play life players might want to poo poo the intellect. Um, is that something that's always been a fundamental part of the way that you think about poker? Or is that perhaps a more recent thing? I think so. I mean, I, yeah, I think so. Um, so like back in the day, there used to be bet sizing tells because people would bet different amounts. Now they just bet the same amount, which is unfortunate or, you know, they'll have two sizings, but it's not the same thing. And yeah, I would just very often see their bet sizing and just like they're not doing that with this part of the range there's just yeah um and i don't know so i yeah then would factor that into the analytical perspective but it wasn't like it wasn't that i'd seen 100 showdowns when they'd bet small it was just 
I know this person kind of, and I, yeah, that's not what they would do. Yeah. You'd love to play against me. I'm, I'm, uh, if I bet a size on the turn, it's a 60% chance that I only have either value or a bluff when I bet that size. So. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> I would like that. I got the size <laughs> <and tells. laughs> Good. It's just very fun because first of all, at the moment I'm playing on GG and I'm balanced versus the rest of the field because people don't know it's me, or at least most people don't know it's me. So when I go two thirds on queen 10, three with value and I go a quarter with a bluff, then no, nobody knows that I'm unbalanced there. And I just play bigger pots with my value hands and I play smaller pots with my bluffs. You know, I'll just go small on the flop with a bluff and then huge on the turn to flop. For me, like the a lot a lot of the way that I I've approached poker and I've taught poker and I, I've helped a lot of people get to the high stakes and it's not I know that there are elements to poker that I'm not an expert in and that's where I would kind of point them. But for me, like getting up to a certain level really requires knowing the way that other people play. And once you manage to get on the level above that, in my opinion at least, you can be a hundred percent value or a hundred percent bluff in most spots. No, okay, I shouldn't say most, but like most turn river spots. And even if that means that your bluffs are going to be like two, like two percent smaller because of the inelasticity of, of the, the way that they're going to play it, just, you know, no one's going to notice that. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, there are a lot of spots where I'm, you know, folding 90% of my range or calling with 90% of my range uh, in river spots. And I think a lot of players, strive not to do that um but i think yeah for the reasons we talk i think i think you're more extreme than i am yeah. but i think it's uh, along the same lines yeah i'm so I, I i watched some of the debate that you've been having recently with doug online about uh with doug Polk online about uh gto uh do you want to maybe steel man his side of the argument so we can really, sure. yeah. really talk about it for, for the people who are at home, who I, I got to say, it's probably very confusing when people see two of the gigantuan, gigantuan titans of the poker world disagreeing on something so fundamental. Yeah. So his argument, I would say, solvers have now taught us the exact correct way to play. And there are so many players who use kind of emotional excuses to not make the right plays that when they would be so much more successful if all they did was just study theoretically sound play and execute it kind of regardless of what they thought. Because if they get to a river spot and think like, oh, well, he's, he's going to fold, he's going to fold like only a third of the time when I pot it here, then I just give up on my bluff because it's not going to work. They're going to think that, but is that their experience talking? Is it their emotion? Talk? Is it their fear talking? Um, and you know, most players end up too weak. And so letting them kind of get, letting them off the hook, um, from what the solver tells them to do, um, by saying that they should trust their emotions, uh, or trust their, their kind of read, I was going to make them play worse. And if you could give your rebuttal to this still man. Um, so I think that he's, I think, I think he's right that most people play too weak and that there's a lot of emotion involved in poker. And so a lot of people are afraid to make a certain play or a lot of people get excited about making a, a certain other play. And so for the, for the players who are losing players, I think he's mostly right. Um, he's mostly right for players who are losing players because they, they haven't built a reliable intuition that has been proven right over time. And they haven't, you know, been crushing people with their reads uh, that they've developed. So clearly they would be, I think, I think they would be better off trying to attempt to emulate optimal strategy because it'll leave fewer holes in their game. And like the way that I take advantage of opponents is that I find those holes in their game that are fear-based or just like a, a misconception about how play works on a certain street. 
Um, and I, I find the kind of spots that they're afraid to bluff in and then I overfold. I find the spots that they are bluffing too much or they love to check raise with their value. So they're over bluffing and then I, and then I overcall. So, um, I think he's right about that, but I, but basically I think the best players in the world, a lot of them, especially like heads up cash. Like when you look at guys like, um, very sweet and even Linus, um, they're making a lot of exploitative plays. They're they're making reads on their opponents, um, and so I think that to I think you're, he's right up into a point. But I think the best poker is it, it involves exploitative play. The best po- I steal man so well that it's actually <laughs> yeah yeah good damn that's a good point Doug. <laughs> yeah. um, but at at high level, basically, like if there's a skill gap between you and your opponent, if you're better than them then i think it would be a shame to not trust your reads um, based on the way that you've observed them playing whether they're intuitive or just logical i think that i think my advice is because because my advice that he kind of attacked was just i don't even remember the exact thing but it was like just you don't know you don't have to bluff because the solver tells you to bluff if you have a good reason not to then don't. Um, and I think that advice, basically, I think it, it is true for people who are better than their opponents. Um, I think though, if you are worse than your opponents, and I mean, that's kind of a vague catch all general, general term, but if you're worse than your opponents, um, you'd be better off n- not trying to make as many kind of, you know, super big read base plays especially because like especially if they're going to make you end up unbalanced in a way that your opponents are going to notice but if you're better than your opponents and that could be you know linus love against a a 510 pro or it could be uh you know a 25 live pro against an amateur um i think you absolutely should be making making reads yeah yeah i think the the skill differential even though it's hard to exactly articulate what that is because skill is a yeah. it's miss it's hard hard to hard to yeah yeah get and I think that's exactly it and it's it's almost like by saying I'm not gonna be unbalanced it, you're waving the, the surrender flag you're saying I'm not gonna venture into this world of leveling wars or trying to have like higher quality range analysis or anything like that it's it's really just a matter of like who can play the you know the most theoretically sound game and I I respect that for some people maybe for a lot of people that would be the best way of of getting good like um something that really challenged my you know some my, one of my my perspectives of poker was i i'd never seen anybody just use solvers and get really really good really really quickly like and and it's kind of an unfair comparison because people like you people like all the best in the world they existed before solvers existed yeah, yeah. Um, and that so it's it's really we don't really have an ab test there um, but actually, there are a few people that have just skyrocketed up through the through the stakes. But from what I've seen, and I, I I've coached hundreds of people one on one and in, in groups, thousands of people, like private group sessions. So much of what I see is it's not that they're not outsmarting their opponents. It's not that they don't have a good intuition for their opponent's range or how to exploit that. It's that when it comes to formulating a thought process, it's all over the place. It's like, they'll be like, well, okay, I'm C-betting this size because it's a dry board and I'm into range bet, but also I've got this blocking and I, and I wanted to have this at hand in my check back range. And it's like all of these concepts just kind of floating and around in, in this, in this ethereal way. And this is where a lot of people, when they come to me for, for coaching, I'll just, even people playing like five, 10, 10, 20 live, or maybe like one, two online. I've just seen so much mess and just the first thing I do is say, okay, what is your opponent's range? And they'll tell me exactly what their range is. What hand have you got? What are we going to do about that? That's all. That's all. Are we going to bluff out that part of the range? Or are we going to value bet by like, okay, if he, if he's got top pair, how much will he call? So what are we going to do? You know, and, and things like that. And it turn it takes people's brain from this like foggy mess into the, oh, okay, poker is actually kind of simple. And then you can build up from that with, with as much knowledge as you need. Yeah. I mean, I think so my experience, uh, I always consider myself, you know, like an exploitative player and I kind of left poker for a few years at the time, like 
kind of a, a little bit after PLO solvers came around, um, and I never used them. Uh, but when I came back to play my challenges, I did study them a lot. And I think it, for me at least, it, it was tough for me to make my intuitive reads on players if I didn't understand kind of the baseline strategy of like how these spots worked. Because sometimes I would be like, oh, they're betting a small sizing here. I think they're weak. And then I realize, oh, no, that's their only sizing when the yeah. board runs out this way. Uh, so I feel like it's important, especially at higher levels, to understand theory. But like you said, to get into like, oh, I only do this with a heart blocker in my hand. Or I only do this when I have the, the backdoor flush draw or like the, the one over card. Like those are things that I think just hold you back and, and cloud your thought process. Yeah, I've seen so many streamers that are playing like hundred dollar buying tournament, and I, you know, this is no bang bang because I, you know, I've, I'm sure I've made many many bigger puns. But just talking about like, oh, okay, so we're gonna check this combo on the flop because we're unblocking the the backdoor flush draw or some some something like that. And it's it must be so confusing to to new players to be like, I play the Sunday million. Am I meant to be unblocking the backdoor when I check? Oh no! Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> when it's just like, no no no, the guy's aware. He's about to gift you uh 200 big blinds just hit a set against him just like so just yeah. cooler him. just wait until you have a value hand you'll be fine just see that once and give up whatever whatever it's going to be um I, so there's definitely it's an endless conversation about game theory and non-game theory and i i feel like it's been beaten into the ground but in the same time in 10 years we'll probably still have a way better understanding than we currently do now so it is valuable conversation um but i i'm curious for you how is your your GTO versus exploit uh, perception of your Twitter play? Like uh, I've seen I've seen you battling around the streets recently, and I've seen you experiment with many di many different strategies. Uh, I've seen the the GTO strat of here's a thread and it's pretty useful, and then I found the exploit strat uh, strat of like here's a funny joke along with something useful. Yeah, what, I've really what, enjoyed what, the... what's going on. <laughs> I've really enjoyed trying to make. Uh something useful and funny. Um, so I, I started in December, I started a, a social media challenge uh, for myself where I had just come off, I was playing a lot and I kind of had a period where I wasn't sure what I was going to work on or do. And I've always been, I don't know, I've always felt like my social media game was very weak and it, I was doing a disservice not only to myself, but to my, you know, business partners that like, I look at every other training site owner and they're just, they're out there. Um, and, and, and they're good at social media. And I just felt like I, I should be so much better in the couple of times I've been like, Oh, I'll try a little bit. And then I try for a week and then I back off. So I was just like, no, I'm going to just going to make this a thing and see what I can learn, uh, over a few months. And I think I learned a lot and I actually on Twitter specifically, I hired a Twitter coach who I, I talked to like once I talked to once a week wow. and just kind of gives me general, it's interesting now because they keep changing the algorithm. And so what worked a month and a half ago doesn't work as well today, but, uh, I give him a lot of headaches because a lot of times he'll suggest something else. No, I'm not doing that. <laughs> um, but it's been, it's been interesting. I guess I'm like, I feel like I'm splitting the difference between GTO and exploitative. I, I used to, Twitter used to be my favorite platform of, of social media is the only one I used kind of voluntarily, I guess I would say. Um, and then I started doing YouTube a little while ago and actually I like YouTube the best now, um, because it's just more about making good content that's helpful to people or entertaining to people. And I think Twitter is now getting a little bit too, like the best strategy on Twitter is not, I think, delivering the best content. No, it's, so to, it, find, it's to find your tribe. Yeah. And make very tribal content for a very long yeah. time. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm trying to, to find a balance to where I'm not just being a fish and like ignoring what I'm supposed to do, yeah. but, uh, you know, to deliver content that I, that I think is helpful to people and sometimes entertaining. And I think one of the biggest hurdles I had to get over is that I, I mean, you mentioned the blue fire. Day. I mean, I think it's been like 15 years that I've been making training videos and they were always 
for advanced players. Like I've taught advanced players my like entire career. I, I rarely have done stuff for beginners and most of my Twitter audience, my YouTube audience, they're beginners. And so there were a few times where I put out a thread that I was like, this is so basic. Like I'm like embarrassed to put this out. Like people are going to laugh at me for putting this out because it's so basic. And then you just get a stream of comments. Like this was so helpful. This, this like changed my perspective. Oh, that's on what CBIT means. No way. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I was like, oh, okay. So like the stuff, there are a lot of things that I take for granted that, that knowledge that I have after two decades of playing poker that are really helpful to people who are starting out. And so I've, I've gotten over that fear of putting out things that are, are too beginner for like my peers. Cause so much of what, what, what I used to put on Twitter was kind of the same things that I would put in training videos. Like I felt like I was speaking to the same audience who were paying a hundred dollars a month for poker training. Um, but that's not, it's not the same audience. And, um, so yeah, that, that like, I, I'm happy that I've figured that out, that, that like explaining concepts that are really useful for beginners has a big impact. Um, I'm happy that I figured that out, but yeah, Twitter as a medium, I'm, I'm liking less and less. I hired a CEO recently, maybe like a month ago, and he is probably the most talented person I've ever met when it comes to being a CEO, which is such a relief to have him. <laughs> and he, he was explaining to me, he was like, your strategy for YouTube, like you're naturally very, like people are drawn to you, you know, like pe people, and I assume it's very similar to you, like people, people just naturally want to come and listen. But for me, my proclivity is to, like you, say stuff that's very complicated and very like high level, even yeah. if it's not like game theoretical high level, it's just like very fast and, you know, for the people that really understand the link, the, the, the jargon, just uh, back to front. And he's like, your YouTube audience is gonna, like your core YouTube audience is gonna click on whatever video you post. But the, the way to really hack the algorithm is to find the normies, it's to find the people that kind of know you or kind of know poker and to really, really dig into that. And that's why someone like uh, uh, Brad Owen is, is really, really good. You know, he, he's the king of saying something that's kind of simple, but saying it in a really fascinating way mm -hmm. and uh, captivating that, that, that other part of the audience. And it's still good for the poker, you know, the actual poker fanatics. And it's, it's also good for the, the, the newbies. Yeah, well put. Yeah. So, uh, another thing I'm curious about with, uh, Twitter is obviously like a very good platform for controversy and you've not dug your feet into too many controversial topics. And, uh, we talked a little bit privately. I was just curious about your perspective on it. And for me, there's this, there's this part, you know, I was bullied as a kid. If I see somebody else getting bullied, no matter if I dislike them, you know, like I, it's not, it's not, uh, unknown that I, I'm, I'm not the biggest fan, fan of Doug, but when I see him getting attacked online multiple times, I've stood up for him being like, actually, no, this is unfair. Like the, you know, you can criticize him about this stuff. Right? If you want but like this, this, come on guys, this is, this is absolutely unholy. And, you know, it causes, <laughs> it causes a lot of tension when I do that online as, as I'm pretty sensitive, you know, it can be a bit of a, a spanner in my works, but for me, it's really important to, to stand up to, to to cruelty or to or to people that are lying about others or slandering others and I'm, I'm curious where where you stand on that um i think i mean this is kind of what i was getting into at the top of the show which is um my my natural state like i'm non-confrontational and my natural state of being is like i don't want to i like my fir the first filter is i don't want to make somebody's day worse and even if that person is being an asshole somebody else it's just like i don't i think it's right uh to stand up to that and i think that i would be a better person if i stood up to to bullies more often and and um kind of called out bad behavior more often but it's so i don't know if i want to say it's, it's not who i am or if i want to say it's hard for me i don't know i don't know what what it really is it's definitely hard for me um, I don't know if that, if, if calling it not who I am is a cop out, um, but it, it's hard for me. 
Yeah, I think I think that's an accurate way of saying it. It's, if it, mm-hmm. it's going to be naturally hard for, for some people and naturally easy for others. Mm-hmm. Um, like I have the natural tendency to do it, but then also in the past, I, I was very sensitive to the to the backlash I got. So it was also very hard for me to, to do it at times. And the more I've managed to heal this, the, you know, the fucking years of this uh, trauma healing and things like this, the more the more I've dug into it, and uncovered all the stuff that was happening um, and obviously still got a long way to go. But the the easier it is to kind of say, OK, whatever the repercussions are, I'm going to try and do the, the right thing. And having that mentality means I'm going to punt more often than other people as well. You know, I'm going to say some stuff that I'll, I'll look back the next day and be like, oh, I was thinking through my ego that time, man. Oh, I thought I was doing the right thing. But it, it as long as, for me at least, as long as it's coming from the place of trying to do as much good in the world as I possibly can, then then that's what's important. Yeah. I think, I mean, I think that's a better, I think it's a better way to be than the way I am. And I have seen like, I mean, just starting to post more on social media in general, I can see how I've become, uh, cause like even I, you know, people will get, uh, negative comments to video or tweet or whatever else. Um, and I can, and four months ago they would hurt me more than they do today. So I can see how just practice, uh, and experience doing that. Um, becomes less and less uncomfortable uh, or less and less painful. That's, that's great that, that, that that's happened. Yeah, I, I love Twitter for that. I like, it's, a, it's such a cesspool of people's trauma just being manifested in their words and actions. But at the same time, I want to get into politics and I want to get into charity. I want to get into like worldwide things and I'm trying to prepare myself as best as possible. And at the moment, a lot of the best strategy for me is just get on Twitter because that's what I'm scared of. You know, that, that's, that's where, that's where the fear kicks in sometimes where I'll say something, I'll be like, you know, <laughs> like, oh my God. Is this when, is it more when you say something, when you call a specific person out or is it when you state something that you know is going to be an unpopular opinion? Unpopular opinion I can handle. Yeah. It's when there's two. So there's, there's one element of, there's a fear of being villainized. And that really comes from deep in my childhood where my mom used to subconsciously look at me like I was my father because I had the same eyes or whatever else. And he was abusive to her. And so she would look at me and get triggered and kind of treat me a little bit differently, maybe quite a lot differently because of that. And there'd be like this disconnection. And because of that, that, that pattern of being seen as the villain has kind of replayed and I've sought out people that would perhaps see me a really high way and a re- then a really low way and it's been this like consistent painful painful journey for me and I, i've been healing it um and online that is like the biggest trigger because there's ten thousand people out there that will think you're the worst person in the world you know there's yeah. there's, there's a person with any opinion that you want to just take your dick um so that that's one of them and the second one is it's less so now it's a lot less so now but I actually ended up deleting my Twitter, the first Twitter I had, um, as is now I'm on my account number two before. And it's when people have a big audience and they they want to use it against you. Mm-hmm. For me, that that's a really scary thing. Like seeing me saying something like kind of wanting to be nice or wanting to be good. And then another person just being like, you're a bitch or whatever it is. Yeah, yeah. Um, doesn't, they could honestly just say anything. And then they just get hundreds of likes or whatever it is. And you're like, fuck, there's hundreds of people out there think I'm a bitch. <laughs> you know? yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I will say in, in particular, as he, he's come up a couple of times in conversation with Doug, uh, I have found myself in he's the past yeah. being really scared of the fact that he uses his audience to hurt people. Um, but at the same time, now I feel a lot more confident to kind of call that out and say, you know, that's not okay. That's really not okay. And um, I, I've spoken to a lot of top creators uh, about these things and everyone's scared. Everyone's scared to say what they truly want to say. And they might not say, Hey, I'm scared. But it's like, you know, there's a bunch of people that are just like, I just don't want to be part of that. You know, I, that that's not something I want in my life. And I get it. Like I really get it. But at the same time, I think I, I would love to see a poker world where it's a little bit more like the chess world online. There's still going to be drama. There's still going to be back and forth. But at the top of the chess world, there are very good people, like very stable people, very articulate people. So if somebody kind of steps out of line and tries to attack somebody else instantly, everyone's like, whoa, 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 wait, 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 
it's not cool. okay. we're just having fun um but we don't quite have that in the bug world yet no not at all i mean we have yeah we don't, we're, we're not close to that i think yeah but we do have the people for it you know like i i feel like if we had voices like yours um even like Joey, Joey Ingram, uh, yeah. Jay Nand, like Jay Nand, there's, there's so many, like Patrick Lander, there's, I could, I could honestly go on and on and on, you know, Jason Kuhn, um, people that are deeply, deeply fair, respected, and uh, want to do good in the world. Yeah. Uh, I feel like if there was more of a coherent effort to do these things, then we would actually already have the pieces set in, in, in place. It's interesting. Yeah, because it is, I mean, like I've, I've said a few times, I just very naturally, it doesn't matter who it is, if they have a big audience or a small audience, I just, yeah, don't want to deal with uh, with uh, confrontation generally. But it is interesting that you say that, because like, yeah, I, I mean, I I can exp I can relate to that part, but also just, it's like a lot to deal with. When you get into, uh, when you get into some kind of Twitter drama, there's just like, you know, days of negative emotions that associated with, um, you know, every time, like you, you open Twitter and you don't know what you're going to see and there's fear. You see, so it's just like, and it kind of feels like, I don't know if it's because of the, because of the way the algorithm is, or just, just the, the nature of Twitter, it just kind of rewards negativity. And so, the i don't know it becomes i think easier for the villain to win on twitter yeah. than in a in a conversation yeah and i think over time that will change i really yeah. i really you know assuming that humanity doesn't blow itself up uh i think that we're gonna get to a point where you know we're so young we're, when it comes to social media we're, mm -hmm. we're complete fish you know we're, we're just like two and l grinders just fucking having at it at each other and in 10 years time and 20 years time we will probably just have a better understanding of how the algorithm messes with our dopamine receptors or whatever mm -hmm. else it is and i really do see a lot of content of people speaking about these things uh and really helping others understand the negative side of social media i think it's just going to take a while to kick in for a lot of people yeah i could see that that makes sense that's an optimistic way of looking at it. Maybe, yeah, maybe, yeah. Maybe there's more cynical. I, I like to well. be. I like to be optimistic, but Twitter does. Yeah, make me feel cynical. <laughs> have Have there been moments in the, in, um, let me think how to word this. Have there been moments in the last, say, ten years, where you've seen somebody be kind of unfairly attacked, and part of you's wanted to say something, but you've ended up not. Uh yeah, countless, yeah. Like giving any examples um i'm trying to think none are popping uh well obviously well okay so the obviously the recent uh berkey stuff which again uh, doug's name is coming up but <laughs> the uh i did i mean i did make one tweet that obviously berkey's not a scammer um, but I, I even got backlash for that. <laughs> How um, dare you? <laughs> yeah. Um, so that was one that I did say something. I mean, I wasn't aggressive. Um, I think, yeah, I think that if, if there's a, it's, it's easier for me to defend somebody when it's not attacking somebody else at the same time. Um, so when it's just like, you know, Berkey's been in the, in the business a while. He's not a scammer, obviously. That's not uh, that's not as hard for me as hey, what you just did to this person is unacceptable. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm struggling to come up with with examples beyond that. But I mean, there have been plenty. I mean, yeah. I mean, I think everybody has times when they they type something out and then they they delete it. Um, but yeah, there have been many times. I can I can think I can think of quite a few that I wasn't in it at the time, so I wasn't I wasn't paying too much close attention. The biggest one for me, and it's sorry, Doug, all the love, <laughs> but is the Alec Torelli one. Yeah, um, yeah. I 
I watched the the first I watched like maybe 20 minute 20 minutes of what happens and from Doug's perspective and I came out thinking oh okay that's probably pretty bad from Alec and years later I watched the the actual raw footage of it and I'm like what this he didn't he didn't angle anyone like it, it was obviously unintentional and to to think that it wasn't is at least a, to a high percentage is is insane and but his image and reputation after that was every single time his his name would come up it would be like oh this guy the angle this guy the angle yeah. and That's to me like imagine imagine having that imagine like your mum google searching your name so proud of her son and then seeing like oh cheater or scammer everywhere imagine imagine like her friends being like hey what's this saying about yourself like, i just the amount of emotional and economical damage that something like a lie like that can do for me it fills me with looking like what the hell man like how how could you do that to somebody yeah no i feel so i actually to be honest you know i remember seeing that about alec um and i think recently i remember seeing you tweet about it but between those times i mean it was forever ago now i don't think i i don't know if i watched videos about it or not but I just assumed he, yeah, I assumed he probably angled. Yeah. I didn't really think much about it and kind of moved on. So, but it's yeah, that does a lot of damage. I think the funny thing is like, I think my feelings, my internal feelings about bullies are probably not that, that different from yours. Um, I think, uh, I think very, very little of them. Um, but the way that I handle, yeah, the way that I handle it is, is a lot different. Well, I mean, I guess you could say, you could say, I think the way I handle it is worse than to be clear, but yeah. Were you, were you bullied as a kid? No. Oh, you're really good at staying out of the way. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I just don't, I just don't, ways, man. don't bother. I don't bother anybody. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it's interesting that a lot of the people who are the, the biggest names on YouTube, a lot of them were bullied. Like a, a, a chunk yeah. of them. You know, Negreanu was, yeah. Doug was, I was, I, I, there's a bunch, bunch of other people. And it's interesting seeing how different people, and I honestly don't think this is a, a merit of being more virtuous or not, because it starts from such a young age, at least from a young age, it's not maybe when you get older, it's, it, it is a case of being more conscious of it. But some people, when they're bullied, they, they take that internally and they're like, I never want to make somebody feel the way I felt. And some people, when they're bullies, they take that internally and they say, I want to make everybody else feel the way that I felt. And it seems like it seems like a coin flip at a young age. But when you get to a certain level of consciousness and sentience, I feel like that's when you have to take responsibility for okay, which way did I go? Yeah, I don't understand how it goes. away. And, you know, now that I think of it, like I was never bullied, but I think that I felt. My, my perception of how people thought of me was very skewed. Um, I was very anxious and I, I kind of like, I kind of felt like an outcast and I wasn't, um, I can look back now more objectively, but I kind of felt like an outcast and things that people said or did made me feel very uncomfortable and, and sad, but they weren't, they weren't bullying me. They weren't even like directed at me. So I think maybe I experienced being bullied without being bullied. Uh, in a way and so i'm very sensitive to the feelings that that people have when they're when they're bullied i i didn't quite fully understand what you said so there were people yeah. saying things like to a group of people or to you but it wasn't mean or what was it <laughs> yeah to me both um like i would i would say that i was i was very socially anxious and i would say go so far go so far as to say i was scared of a lot of social interaction that came along with just being a teenager, getting older. And so even just hearing people talk about the party they just went to, or uh, hearing people talk about drinking at, at a young age, or hearing people talk about drugs, it made me like really uncomfortable. It made me feel um, lesser than because I was not doing all those things. And I wasn't like, I, I just felt like I couldn't, I felt I wasn't capable of like living in their world. And so I think often just, uh, just kids being kids, not even, yeah, not directing anything at me, 
uh, would make me feel sad and make me feel lesser than them. I, yeah, I feel that. And so when I was younger, I was diagnosed with Asperger's and, uh, I mean, it's, it's an intense diagnosis to get as a kid and it, it really shows exactly how disconnected I was from other people. And I was just the odd one out in so many situations. And I'm not saying you were as well, but if, if you felt like it, I definitely felt like that too. And there were just so many times where I just watched kids being kids. And I was like, I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to kids, you know, I, I, I can talk about maths and go, I run escape. <laughs> you know, this was basically in my, that's my range right now. And I had to really navigate intellectually how to, how to be, you know, how to just exist in, in quite a, you know, harsh world. Yeah. yeah it's fun. Like I look back now and like, I'm pretty sure everybody liked me, but I just thought every, I just thought people thought I was weird and different. And I think, it, yeah, I think it all lived in my head. So I think I had that experience, but without anybody causing it. <laughs> That's so interesting. I'd love, to, I'd love yeah. to have like a good three hour conversation with you about why that was, but it's probably not the time. Um, how, do, how does that manifest now? Like, do you, do you still have elements of that in your family life or in your personal life? Um, I never, no family. So my, it still exists. Um, I, once I'm comfortable with somebody, there's no element of it. Um, once I know somebody well and I'm comfortable with them, I would say I feel the way most people feel uh, in, in social interactions. But um, in in new situations, and actually, like, like, we don't know each other well, but this conversation is comfortable. Even if somebody I totally didn't know was having a conversation like this, I'd be comfortable. Someone uh, also diagnosed with social anxiety explained to me something that really resonated with me is that if you just meet somebody and you get into a deep conversation, it's, it's totally comfortable, but it's actually the small talk and the kind of, uh, the social maneuvering aspect that is, that is really uncomfortable and where you, where I think I'm falling down. And so I'll still, <laughs> so a funny thing happened, uh, the last WSOP, I had like a funny realization where it was, it was, uh, I think a high roller PLO tournament, like 25 K. PLO tournament and I was playing and I'm trying to think of how to put it, but basically I was feeling like, I was feeling like not logically, but emotionally, I was feeling like I wasn't as good. I wasn't playing as well as like, I wasn't as good a player as these people. And they were like, they, they thought I was playing badly. And, and then one guy that like comes to the table and sits down and says something like, Oh, we're playing with the, the greatest of all time. Yeah. And I was like, Oh yeah, they don't think that that's, that's <laughs> yeah. <what I'm> <laughs> dude. I've had that so many times. Honestly, I sometimes get that sitting down at a one, two life. Yeah. And it, the exact same thing has happened where I'll sit down and I'm like, Oh my God, they all know I'm trash. They all know they've watched me play. And it's like, it, logically if you point a gun to my head just like is there any chance of this being true obviously not and then one person will be like oh give you a walk because you're charlie i'm like oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. wait wait a second i've got to recalibrate something yeah. <laughs> thank you <laughs> yeah yeah so it just manifests basically like i think people are thinking more negatively about me than they are uh routinely but not if i not if i know them well does it happen in in like uh podcasts and things like that. Obviously you said not, not this one, maybe. No, not, not really. Not if we're having a real conversation. And you know, the thing about podcasts, like being interviewed, there's a very clear uh, convention of you ask me a question and I answer it. There's no like navigating, oh, am I supposed to say something now? Or, oh, I haven't talked for 30 seconds and there's silence and it's weird. Like I know what I'm supposed to do. So there's, there's no <laughs> discomfort. There's no discomfort there. Cool. I want to take this in a completely different direction because I just had a thought. I'm going to title this Charlie convinces Phil Galfond of magic. All right. So I've, seen, <laughs> I've, I've seen you, I've seen you make, um, a lot of comments about, uh, kind of like metaphysical phenomena not existing. And I want to debate you on it. Okay. And I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you a hard time in it. 
Okay. Um, so could it, maybe if I can just get like a brief overview, uh, materialist, atheist, things like this. Agnostic. Um, I, um, I, I mean, I'm born Jewish, um, but my family was not very religious. My dad was very, he was an atheist. Um, and I consider myself an atheist for a long time, but eventually just realized I, I don't know. Um, and I prefer that perspective, but I'm, um, I'm, I would consider myself open, uh, but my, my like, but I consider myself open, but still on the side, like more towards not believing in, in, in things that are not, you know, what, what others would describe as supernatural. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So but I'm I not, to... I'm not closed off to the, to the idea. So if I would say something like telepathy, you know, what well, as a Bayesian, what's your percentage that telepathy could be a real phenomenon that exists between human beings? Can you define telepathy? I, I'll, I'll, I'll go hardcore. Like I would be able to have a conversation with somebody who's in a different room and it would be so precise that we would then be able to like write down the same thing. Um, that's, I, I pretty strongly, I, I think it's less than 1%. I would right. call that. That's where I used to be too. And then life yeah. kicked me in the fucking balls a few thousand times. And I was like, Whoa, what the hell? <laughs> All right. So are you familiar is his, his, his debate. Uh, I've been doing a lot of debate streams recently, so yeah. sorry if I go into debate mode a little bit, but, uh, are you, are you familiar with any of the scientific literature behind the psi phenomena? No. Uh -huh. Perfect. Well, under, <laughs> under 1% as in familiar with the, the scientific literature. So, <laughs> so it's, it's obviously not mainstream and yeah. obviously a lot of mainstream scientists would have uh, some heavy criticisms of, of these, of these, uh, these studies and things like that. But there's actually a whole cohort of scientists who have dedicated a lot of their their, their professional lives towards uh, experimenting with with these exact phenomena. So there's a, there's a lot of different examples. One one for telepathy would be. So imagine you're sitting in a room, you got a phone in front of you, and you have all over the world your ten closest compadres waiting for an RNG random number generator for those people at home, uh, to choose them. And then they ring you and you have to guess who mm -hmm. has rung you. And obviously by chance you get one in 10 over infinite sample. Uh, so you could do a thousand sample. And you know, if you end up even getting like three out of 10 over a thousand samples, the chance of that being a coincidence is going to be millions to one, probably mm -hmm. Maybe tens of millions to one, I don't know, something like that. So that's one example of a study that's been done, replicated analyzed double blinded things like this uh and has been published and mainstream journals won't touch it because it would be what did the study find exactly or you know what were the what was the data uh so people got a success rate that would be millions to one of coincidence okay yeah so yeah this it, people crushed it and if you speak to people who are like deep into spirituality one of the criticisms is they don't even get people that have been like finely trained so if you were to look east, you know, we have cultures that are millennia old and within Hindu cultures, Taoist cultures and uh, Buddhist cultures and many other cultures, Sikh cultures, uh, Islam, things like that, even Christianity back in the day before they wrote it out of the Bible. Um, then there were examples of people having these metaphysical, which I don't actually believe in metaphysical uh, powers. And I think in, in uh, Hinduism, they call them cities. Um, and it's, it's meant to be a very common phenomena, phenomenon that happens, or these are common phenomena that happen when you go deep enough into, into your spiritual journey. And uh, yeah, one of their criticisms would be actually, you're not getting people who are good enough at these things to do them. So there have been still, there have been tons and tons and tons of these uh, these scientific experiments done. I actually had a podcast with one of the, the authors, one of the scientists that, uh, that wrote a book called real magic. And he's like a 
true uh, skeptic you know is super super scientific very very precise and very honest from from at least my perspective and he amongst other people like rupert sheldrake and many many others have done so many of these tests shown so many of these things to be true published their results replicated it through other people's experiments uh you know peer reviewed and then they put it out into the world and 90 x percent of people are just like nah and so that that's one angle that i would go for secondly would be experiential things that i've experienced that completely go against the laws of newtonian physics but we'll get maybe get into that later <laughs> thirdly there are throughout history the greatest minds that have ever existed many 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 of them mm -hmm. have had such deep metaphysical practices so if you look at isaac newton he believed uh so much in alchemy that he actually spent more time trying to turn shit into gold or various find, find the elixir of life uh than he did in his his phys physics work um if you look at einstein he's always talking about metaphysical phenomena if there's max planck who was a panpsychist believed that the fundamental layer of the universe is consciousness uh, bertrand russell also believed that um carl jung you know there's there's so many names that have all of these deep metaphysical beliefs or practices and we live in a very precise time, in a very precise culture, in a little bubble that we call the Enlightenment, that has completely neglected these things, despite having the scientific literature, despite having the mechanisms in place, and despite if you actually, if somebody goes to India and sees these things for themselves or spends enough time with a, an indigenous or shamanic tribe and gets to experience these things themselves, um, despite that happening, it still isn't believed. Are there, so I understand, so just thinking about the study, um, people get, I'm just trying to think of why, you know, if this, <clears throat> why people haven't been convinced. So if there are people who are much better at that, why are there not um, kind of, why is there not kind of, basically someone performing what is essentially magic, but without doing, you know, without it being a trick. Why is, why is, I don't, I'm not, I don't know what the kind of limit of this capability, what, what limit, what the limit of the best human on earth at this kind of thing uh, is, but I would imagine it would seem good. It would be enough to, if I watched it with my own eyes, change my mind. Would you, believe that I, to be I, true. I completely feel what you're saying. Um, so if you were to think of something like telepathy, it's very hard to, you know, if you were to make a video on it and many, many people have made videos on it. Many people have done like the exact thing you're meant to do to prove it to the world. And people just say, well, they, they probably lied. They probably faked it. The methodology is probably stupid. And it's very easy to just dismiss with a single brushstroke. And, you know, short of getting somebody who is, you know, like a yogi from the top of the mountain and ushering them down out of out, out of India or whatever and saying, okay, sit in this room, we're going to put stuff on you and we're going to make sure that you don't have any access to stuff like this. Uh, short of doing that, it's, it's pretty hard to showcase yeah. something like telepathy. <laughs> but um, are there people, do you, do you believe there are people who are, I mean, like you said, like we're in a different room We've had a conversation in our minds and we could write the same thing. You, you believe there are people who could do that with, you know, near hundred percent accuracy. Like, I, I, I believe, I believe that over 99.9%. .9%, yeah. yeah. Uh, I've witnessed okay. it and uh, I've okay. experienced it. Yeah. I, do you want to, do you want a story? Yeah, I do. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Cool. All right. So there's, there's so many I could choose from, but let me, let me finish. I'll tell, I'll tell you the story of, uh, it's, Hannah, Hannah, my, my wife was very, very involved with this. <clears throat> so basically Hannah and I were having a lot of troubles with, she used to be diagnosed with dissociative identity disorder and long story short for that, the psychiatric community finds it very hard to heal. Mm -hmm. Hannah and I managed to find somebody that could heal it from her in, a, in less than a day, uh, through metaphysical means. And I, I went from experiencing her having very, very intense symptoms every single day of her life. You know, it was a 0% chance she was faking 
there's uh, you know i yeah. saw saw her switch i saw her lose uh you know her her face would change her body would change uh you know she was like everything her voice would change she would lose memory for long periods of time and she would do horrendous things uh which is very classic for somebody who has did multiple personality disorder <laughs> we very very long story short found a person who lives up the mountain and mm -hmm. this person did something to her and ended up healing her and i i'll, I'll tell you more about it off, off camera if you want yeah and the first time i went to visit this person up the mountain i i, I got a plane and i got a train and then i got a car and then i, I met this person up the mountain and, and she's russian and i brought a russian translator with me as well um, and it was, it was like a scene out of a film it was crazy and she showed me things that went against the laws of newtonian physics now i was already very open to these things um so you know you could argue that okay charlie's just suggestible or anything like that but i i'm i'm a, I'm a skeptic i'm a scientist at heart and you know before poker i was going to be a theoretical physicist i was like really atheist and hardcore like you know whatever and various things happened and i came back very skeptical of her i came back like really like doubting because she said a lot of things that seemed to not be very smart. And I was like, for somebody that's claiming to be able to do it, and I've seen some stuff, I was like, that's what's confusing about it. But some of the things she said was really stupid. And I was in the middle of a W Coop, I think, might be school, I think it's W Coop. And I was in an Airbnb by myself, right? And I was walking around this lake uh, before the session, just thinking about it, you know, really, really thinking about mm -hmm. it. And I felt in my mind, and I, it's hard to explain exactly how I knew, how I felt it. I felt her presence. It. I felt it. <clears throat> and I start thinking to her, here are some of the things that I'm skeptical about. This is, these are some of the doubts that I'm having. This is why I'm having this, this problem. You know, and I'm just pretending like, I thought it was just a psychological phenomenon. I didn't think anything mm -hmm. of it. I was just like, whatever, I'll just use this as a, a way to explain explain my skepticisms and get my thoughts out and this goes on for a while and i get back to my grind station and i have a message from the translator i think it was actually a different translator but <coughs> the, another translator that i was using a friend that spoke russian and she says this person whose name i won't i won't say the, the person mm -hmm. up the mountain she overheard all the things that you were saying in your head and gave specifics. And she says she doesn't want to see you ever again. And the let again, this is, and I could have chosen dozens and dozens and dozens of things that have happened precisely like that, where I've tested the exact things that they've mm -hmm. said. And I've tested it, I've made sure that it's exactly that. I've made sure there's no way that could have possibly known it was literally only in my head. And then I've asked something that was completely impossible to gauge and they've given a precise answer and that's exactly what happened and it doesn't go never, sorry say again did you never see her again or did that change i apologized and we found out actually that the translator that we that i brought up the mountain was mistranslating some of the stuff and i think intentionally so i we were talking about psychedelics and i was trying to ask like the metaphysical uh, repercussions of psychedelics and the response I got was, well, there are no good, there are no good sites to psychedelics. And I was like, nobody thinks that, like, obviously there are some good yeah. sites. <laughs> you know I mean, it makes you happy. That's got to be a good side. And that, that was one of the, the really stupid things. And then I, I asked her once I brought up a different translator and she was like, no, obviously there's, there's a good size to it. Here's what I meant. Here's what I actually said. Yeah. Um, and yeah, then, then after that, I brought Hannah up the mountain and, uh, she did, she did a healing on Hannah. I literally watched something leave her body. I saw it. I was sober. I saw something leave her body. And after that, she never switched again. And, uh, yeah, again, these are there's a couple of examples out of hundreds, honestly. Yeah. I mean, obviously if I experienced what you experienced, I would feel a lot differently. And so how does, how does one, um, happen upon yeah, you just got to walk up mountains for a while until you find somebody. Uh, I mean, we'll talk after. We maybe All right. Change something. There, <laughs> yeah. there are other people in the poker world, by the way, that are going through similar similar things. They're just a lot less vocal about it. 
yeah and that you'd be amazed how many people in the book world believe like you can change the 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 luck of your cards just by believing it like some some of the, like the super hyper rational people in the high stakes poker community fully believe that like yeah. beyond yeah. doubt do you believe that <laughs> no comment because things get clipped and uh yeah. but i wouldn't be surprised if it was true i mean maybe that's my opinion yeah, if i've just got to say in a way that's not going to be clipped with <laughs> yeah you know <laughs> yeah yeah cool <laughs> uh... and, and again th this is something that's actually been tested as well um if you wanted to read the book real magic it's i i would strongly recommend it it's, it's kind of like a good bridge between the the materialist naturalists atheists way of thinking and the more metaphysical panpsychic whatever you want to call it open to these psi phenomena and it lays out so many of these things and that they, they even found so it's so like one of one of the things is like hey can we can we try and mess with this rng using our fucking brain it's obviously a really simple study to make the rng give a higher number than it normally would and then just run it a thousand times and we'll give it a go and the answer was yes and the answer was replicated many many times and the most interesting thing is that the answer was also found to retroactively work, meaning that if they put an RNG and had all of these numbers within within a you know hard disk, what do people use? The USB panel, <laughs> showing my age there, <coughs> floppy disk, <Yeah>. um, <laughs> <laughs> and it's locked in. And then they get a bunch of people to no 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 you know and try and try and uh, yeah. try and make the number go higher. Uh, the chance, yeah, they they managed to do it with the chance of it being coincidence being tens of millions to one, and they managed to do it multiple times. Wow. And yeah, this this is this hardcore scientific research that is being ignored for for many reasons. But you, things that we do know, uh, quantum physics, seem to work very similarly. Seems to be a lot a lot of very very profoundly uh, renowned physicists that believe that retroactively we can we can alter the state of particles. Um, and you know, there's there's debate around that, but it's it's a it's a it's at least known that the 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 observer's consciousness can collapse the superposition of of, of a particle just by observing, and so it, it definitely doesn't go against the laws mm -hmm. of physics as we know them. It's just against ostensible Newtonian physics. Yeah, I understand that. Would do you think that to? Well, I'll give an example first. So I, I've I've worked with different um, uh, like. I guess I don't know what to call them, but mindset coaches. Uh, and then one guy that I've worked with believes in a lot of things that you're talking about. Is he in the book so, world? No. Oh, okay. I was going to say, I know who you mean. But no. Okay. And so with him, I've, I, I went, like I've done exercises with him where I kind of go inside my opponent's mind. I've done exercises where I spoke to my dad after he passed. And I've, I've always, I've not believed that that was what was going on, but I still thought it would be helpful. And I found it to be helpful just as an exercise and kind of getting into my subconscious. Um, so my question is, do you believe, so, so because of that, I'm very open to, to learning and trying things. Cause I think it's a kind of a free roll in that, you know, worst case you're, you're, healing yourself, um, subconsciously and, and best case it's, it's what you believe. Um, do you think you need to like to really explore this stuff? Do you need to believe in it? Do you need to not be skeptical or you can just, no, no. no. So when I, when I first had an experience like this, I'll, I'll tell, I'll tell the story briefly if you don't mind as well. It's a really fun one. I was hardcore atheist. I was atheist before I even knew what the word atheist meant. I, I was I was getting in trouble in Sunday school when I was two for asking like why, you know, to questions like Jesus says you do this, and I'm like why, and they're like huh? <laughs> <laughs> Jesus said <laughs> sit down, um, and yeah, by by a very very young age, I I was like super super atheist, and uh, even by the age of like 22, I still was. Um, and I, I went to, I remember I went to this ayahuasca ceremony when I was, I, I think I was 21 mm. and very long, actually I'll, I'll say from him, I, after I drank the ayahuasca, I, it was a very cognitive experience. It was literally, I was just having a conversation with ayahuasca in my head and I was like, I don't believe any of this, but I'll just go along with yeah. it because why not? I mean, I'm in a fucking TD with some shamans. So what else am I going to do? You know? And 
I was getting answers back from ayahuasca and I'd ask it a question and then this thing would pop in my head and it'd be like, yes. And I'd be like, this question, it'd be like, no. And I'd ask this question, it's like, can't really say that. And I was like, okay, well define some terms. Probably means like with all the information that I have currently inside of my existence, the, pro- the chance of this being true is going to be between X and Y, you know, something like that. We got really into the fucking nitty gritty. I still didn't believe in it. Mm-hmm. And I'd gone there with a few intentions. And one of them was, do I want to be with my current girlfriend back then? And do I want to tell her that I cheated on her? So I used to cheat on people all the time. Traumatized, challenge. I feel terrible about it, but whatever. It happened. And more, more stuff happened. I remember I was laying, laying down. There's probably 30 of us in, the, in this TV. It's in England, but there's the Brazilian shamans came over. Brazilian ayahuasca. And I had my eyes closed <coughs> and I was trying to work out whether I wanted to be with her, whether I want to be with her. her name's Amy. And I was thinking, okay, I'm going to list, and I had this visual part of my brain that had been unlocked because, you know, ayahuasca, I was like, I'm going to list all of the things that I that are pros and all of the things that are cons. And I did that. And I was like, okay, now I have to weight them. This is more important than that, et cetera, et cetera, like the pure intellectual way of doing things. And I got just got to the point where, okay, this is such a multivariate analysis. I can't do it. Like my intellect is incapable of making this decision. This is why I'm so stuck on it. And I was like, well, what do I do? And as in that moment, I'm, I'm laying on the TV floor, fucking eyes closed, right? I get a tap on my foot. I'm like, Whoop. <laughs> you know? yeah. and for all, the, all this shaman knows I could have been asleep because there are a bunch of people asleep. Yeah. But shaman Dan looks at me, D-H-A-N. He looks at me and he goes <laughs> with a feather. He's like, <laughs> does this cleansing thing. And I'm like, folks. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> And he looks at me dead in the eye and he goes, Charlie, you are a very, very smart young man, but you are young. You must learn not to only think with your head, but to think with your heart. And I was like, what the fuck did he know what I was just thinking about? Okay. And I looked at him. I was like, what? <laughs> it's like all I got out. And he just, t- he goes off to help another person. He turns over and looks over me and shoulders. and goes, you know what I mean? I was like, <laughs> Fuck, dude, I know exactly what he means. How does he know that I know what he means? That's kind of yeah. weird. <laughs> and um, I laid down and I felt, okay, what does it feel like to be with her? What does it feel like to be without her? And I decided I want to be with her. And I was like, what does it feel like to tell her I cheated? What does it feel like to do? And I was like, Fuck, I have to tell her that I cheated. Mm-hmm. And I told her she broke up with me and was heartbroken for a year and it was great. It was what I needed. Yeah. And um, after that, my belief in telepathy went from 0.001% to 0.1%. You know? Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, I was just, I was like, there's probably some trickery going on. I don't know what the hell happened. And after hundreds of different experiences, eventually I got to the point where I was like, okay, I now know that this exists. Uh, I'm, I'm going to stop pretending I don't. Yeah. I mean, I, I would love to be, um, I would love to have an experience that, that changed my mind. Um, and I, I don't, my mind's not even made up, but yeah, I haven't, you know, change the percentage. 99%. Yeah. Change yeah. the percentage. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I got you, bro. I got you, bro. And even, even if like, I, I can swear on my family's life that I'm telling the truth. And I do, I swear on my family's life that the things I've been saying are as good a truth as I can get out. Maybe, maybe I've got some, like, question, some yeah. slight things wrong, you know, like slight tiny things, but as best as I can. Um, but without experiencing it yourself, it's hard to it's hard to ever believe it. It is, yeah, because I believe you, but then I, I don't know. Yeah, there's something about it when it goes against um, so much of kind of um, like common knowledge um, that you've assumed your whole life. There's something about just yeah, you need it. You need it proven. You got to feel it. You got it. You got to yeah. experience. I f- I found that with myself as well. Like. I could have somebody who I, whom I trust as much as I trust myself rationally and to be honest and for them to be honest and if they experience something is, I won't believe it as much as if I do. And that's irrational of me probably, but I'm, yeah. fucking, I'm human. Yeah. So I'm sorry. I'm not a very good debate partner. Cause I'm not, I mean, I'm open. I'm not disagreeing. Um, I just know that I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe we can talk after him. 
like on Chromebook sure. or something. Yeah. 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 Um, maybe maybe one one last uh, topic if you have time. Yeah, I do. <laughs> Fantastic. You're a you're a dad, right? Yes. Of how many kids? Uh, one. He's four. Cool. What's his name? Spencer. Who chose the name? I mean, we both did, but I guess I it was, I think I brought us to the table. Does it have like a meaning, or is it just something that felt right? No, just just liked it. So I'm I'm one month into having a. Yeah, I didn't know it was exactly one month, but I knew it was recent. Yeah. Months and six days. Yeah. Are you Are you getting sleep? <laughs> eight hours a day. Eight hours a night. Good. Yeah, I'm crushing it. Yeah, doing great. <laughs> How about you? <laughs> uh, now I'm good. Yeah, but the first, like the first two months, were exhausting. Yeah, we we have very different parenting strategies to what people are recommended. I, I'm curious, how, how did you, if it's not too personal, how did you do the birth? Oh, uh, we did it uh, traditional uh, or yeah, the normal way. Hospital, uh, or no, hospital. Med medications? Uh, yes. Yeah. We went uh, full physiological, meaning zero medication at mm -hmm. home, just me and Hannah. Yeah, that's cool. I think. Yeah. We actually, so uh, my wife was pregnant once before and miscarried and that time, it was interesting, that time she was interested in, uh, like we met, we had a midwife and I think we were going to do, I don't know if we're going to do it at home, but I think more, I don't know. Like a water birth in a hospital or something yeah, like that. Yeah. Do you think that maybe having the, the miscarriage would have scared her a little bit? Maybe. I, I kind of forget, honestly, why that changed i think it was on i think it was probably more than anything um like laziness like it was just when the time came again just went to a hospital and i don't know we just mm -hmm. met it's with a good. doctor nearby we didn't like spend a lot of time looking into it like again yeah. it always has to be the mother's choice anyway so yeah, yeah. for me hannah, hannah knew she wanted to do that for many many years Many, many lifetimes you might say but uh yeah she she definitely she was she was very 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 convinced that, that that was right and we looked into a lot of the the data behind birthing and a lot of the the issues that come with hospital births and like for for instance they will induce labor with uh synthetic hormones yeah and uh, i think it's called pitocin which is the oxytocin yeah. synthetic and then that will often cause another issue down the line, which will then have to medicate again, and another issue down the line, which then more medication has to come. And the data for births that you know involve medication versus ones that don't, the the baby shows a lot a lot better signs kind of afterwards. And yeah, there's, there's... and I know they they you end up uh, uh, getting a cesarean more often, like much more often than you should need to. Um, we didn't. But that's yeah. yeah. I remember. I remember. Yeah, watching videos about that uh, the first time. Yeah. yeah, it's 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 honestly to to me it's so wild. And obviously, there's a part of it that's like, thank God for modern medicine. You know, yeah. there are, there are people out there that exist right now that wouldn't otherwise exist. Um, and I I completely empathize with the the way of you know going going this what people see as the safe route. And for some people, it probably is the safest thing to do. Um, but Hannah took a large course in how to do free birthing. I, I, I spent countless hours researching these things and talking about them with her. And mm -hmm. in this eventuality, we'll do this. In this eventuality, we'll do this. But it uh, ended up just being the most beautiful, easy thing. Not easy for her. <laughs> it was tough for her. Yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, like, <laughs> of course. Um, but yeah, it was, it, was, it was so sacred. It was so, it was so beautiful. Awesome. Do you remember? Do you remember the first time looking into your your son's eyes? I do. Yeah, I remember. It was actually the most memorable moment was that uh, Farah had been it, it, it. She'd been pushing so hard for so long, and he just wasn't coming out. Um, and they thought so. They thought we were gonna have to. They were gonna take her to get a C section. Um, the doctor came in and finally. And like, we actually 
got dressed to go, like I got dressed to go to the operating room, like got this stuff on my shoe, you know, the whatever. Um, and the how doctor, are you feeling? how are you feeling at that time? Honestly, my, I think when I under pressure, I just go into problem solving mode. So I'm just yeah, like paying attention. Nice. Yeah. What can I, <laughs> what, what is, what actions can I take now that would, that would help? Um, That's line, yeah. so I wasn't, I wasn't feeling it too much, but, um, anyways, b basically the, he finally came out and she had been pushing and she, because of medication, she didn't like, she didn't know he came out. And so they like picked him, picked him up and just seeing the kind of shock on her face, um, when she saw that he was there, um, was a really special moment for me. She didn't feel it. Was, was it pain medication? Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, she felt, I'm, Sorry. she felt pressure and pain, but it was no different than the other pushes that she felt pressure and pain. And so she was like ready. She'd been going at it. I don't know how many hours and she was just ready to keep going. And then there he was. Yeah. That's, that's crazy. And, uh, are there parts of you that have opened up emotionally through these experiences with having a son? You know, I don't know. I mean, I definitely love a child in a different way than you love other people, or at least I, I have, but Other, other than that, I mean, it's like, yeah, I feel differently about him than I feel about anybody else uh, in the world, but otherwise I don't feel like it's been a, I, I don't know. I've always considered myself pretty emotional and f that I feel a lot of things. And so I, I haven't noticed another difference other than that. Have you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's interesting. Like I've, the love element to it. I haven't noticed, like it's a different flavor, but I haven't noticed like that deeper intensity, the, so for, for me, love is like a, I meditate with love for hours, um, sometimes hours at a time. And, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll dig deep into a person that I might not like, or a person that I like, or a historical figure or a group of people, or even a tree. And I'll try and I'll get into a meditative, trance state or a state um and i'll feel what a lot of people get when they go on psychedelics or you know if they spend a lot of time doing meditation they'll all report they'll all re many people will report if this kind of like oneness and, and thing and that that oneness is often described as love like god is love you know etc and you can ask like why does that happen when you take psychedelics or meditate but it's, you know, whatever. and um so that the the intensity of love hasn't been more but it has been so unique and primal, you know, mm -hmm. it's like the, this human element to Charlie is just switched on to a point that I've never noticed before. Like the, the protective side of me, everything yeah. I'm constantly like looking out, like what could I want? Yeah. Um, the, the joy, that comes out and maybe it is more of an intensity of love. It's so hard to get these words, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. Uh, when she lays on me, like I'll, I'll, I'll take, I'll take my top off and just have like skin to skin contact and I could lay there for so long. Yeah. yeah I remember that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's something different. And you, uh, are you, so <laughs> one thing I remember about the first few months and this is what I'll, parents that I've talked to say, and then they have their second and third and they're just more chill. But like, you, there are so many things that you, that I worry. I don't want to keep saying you cause every, something hey, like, one. wait, is he supposed to be like, I don't know. Is he supposed to be doing that? Hey. We need to like, we need to figure this out. He might, I don't know. You just, there was a lot of worry and that was maybe the, the hardest part uh, of the first few months was just stressing about many different things that were nothing. Yeah. There was one moment that was really intense where <laughs> it was less than 24 hours after the birth. I'd gone out to go get groceries. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, first time I, uh, you know, obviously left the house and Hannah was left alone with Alora. And at the point of when I was furthest away, I just got to the shop. I get a phone call from her and she's panicking, truly panicking 
saying Laura just wasn't breathing for 30 seconds or a minute. And it was kind of all over the place. And I was like, you sure? And she sounded like very, and I can be a little bit of a hypochondriac. Sometimes she fully admits that she did not love her about her, but um, you know, it's hard sometimes for her to discern truth from reality when it comes to health, uh, at least in the moment afterwards, she's very uh, cognizant of it. Yeah. And uh, I was like, okay, she was like, what should I do? And I was like, if there's a chance that she's in serious danger, call on call an ambulance, obviously call an ambulance. Um, so she called an ambulance and I sped home went yeah. very fast, <laughs> faster than I should have probably. <laughs> yeah. Um, and in that moment I was really facing my fears of her mortality. Something I faced with myself and Hannah and all the people closest to me, I, I faced deep in meditation or in experience or whatever else. Um, and I've managed to come to terms with that, those things where there's no dread anymore for the, for my death. But in that moment, oh God, yeah, I was really fighting. Yeah, it, of course. And, um, yeah, we ended up taking her into the, into the hospital and she was completely fine. Um, yeah. and she was just a, a newborn that breathed funny because newborns breathe funny. And that, like really funny, <laughs> like hold their breath for a low, very long period of time. Funny, you know? Um, so yeah, that there, there's been, there's been that moment <laughs> and apart from that, just small things that come up and then I'll just breathe and then it will go away. And then I'll realize that, um, yeah, every, everything's okay. So more, more so with Hannah, she's had quite a few of those moments, but with me, it's, uh, it's only been that one really. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's just, I don't know. It's it, yeah, it can be scary at times. I've, I, the last one I remember, which like I've, yeah, I've calmed down since he's gotten older, but there was just one where he, I mean, it's not, it wasn't even that big a deal, but he was two and sitting on a bench and basically just fell backwards and hit his head on the ground. It was hard. I don't know what, what surface it was, but it was hard. And, um, I don't know. He seemed kind of out of it and I'm just worried. Does he have a concussion? Is he, do I need to take him somewhere? And I remember talking to a friend of mine who had a daughter who was a little bit older. Uh, and he was just like, yeah, I've had that happen a number of times yeah. and just, you know, they've, they're built to withstand the things that happen to them. Yeah, exactly. uh, yeah, they're super like, they, you know, they're super flexible and they're, I don't know, they just, they can handle it. And, they don't weigh much when they hit the deck. It's just bounce yeah. back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, may maybe as she gets older and she's like climbing on stuff, maybe that's where, you know, other parts of my fears will come up. But um, in general, I seem to be pretty on, on, on top of those things. And it, it's nice to be the more kind of emotionally stable one in that spot. In other mm -hmm. spots, Hannah's the more emotionally stable one, but at least when it comes to kind of, understanding whether something's like a genuine danger or not i seem i seem to be uh seem to be pretty pretty stoic in those spots um yeah. are there any big things that you'd be like looking back oh here's, here's some advice i I love to give to parents advice um, is like the wrong word but you know whatever yeah i well the, it sounds like you've been sleeping well the first one so we um for a while we were just most people tell you like sleep when he sleeps and uh that was I found that to be miserable because he would, you know, fall asleep for 40 minutes. I'd spend 20 minutes trying to fall asleep and then, I'd, yeah, maybe get 10 minutes of sleep and then he wakes up. And then for the next hour, all I could think of is like, please go back to sleep, which is not what you want to be thinking when you're spending time with your baby. So we ended up, uh, taking shifts, taking 12 hour shifts and we'd have some overlap, but basically, okay, I got him. Well, this was, this was once, um, so Farrah wasn't, Well, she was struggling to breastfeed after a little while. And so we started uh, supplementing. And so it was only once that happened that we could take shifts. And were, it, were you supplementing with bottle or with formula? Uh, it was, well, we both. So we would, we would save some and then we had to supplement with formula because she wasn't uh, producing enough. Mm -hmm. And yeah, only, only then did we take shifts and it just made things a lot better because then we're like, awake and enjoying our time with him rather than hoping that he falls asleep. Yeah. Um, other things. Yeah, I don't know. So the, the way that we're doing sleep is yeah. uh, we sleep in separate beds. 
and we were already doing that before and for me it, it's it's kind of perfect because now so hannah is with Laura 24 7 at the moment right. there's not there's maybe 20 minutes that she'll take a shower or something like that but even then she'll often take her with her um so it's really powerful for one of us to be able to be like fully awake and she's sleeping maybe like six hours six hours a night anyway um but she does stuff to get up and breastfeed and she's still yep. trying to figure out exactly the, the balance of these things um and yeah laura sleeps with her in the bed which again in the in the medical community is like a big no-no mm -hmm. um, you meant to have like a car and a crib and things like that but in uh yeah in, in my opinion the, yeah, yeah. if you can negate the, the danger of suffocation and things like that with with various measures it it's it helps the connection of the, the bond between mother and daughter that makes sense what's your stance on that as the years go on um we've talked about it and we're probably going to have her sleep with hannah for a couple a couple of years at least maybe like mm -hmm. three and then once she gets old enough to make her own decisions even if they're very like rudimentary things we'll, we'll allow her okay would you like here or here you know caught or whatever um and try and introduce autonomy like that you know okay yeah she'll want to keep sleeping with hannah i'm Good. almost positive <laughs> yeah because <laughs> yeah, Hannah, hannah's gonna want to too yeah. honestly i've never seen uh i haven't seen many people with their, with their newborns but hannah is so connected it's like before Laura is about to ask for food hannah knows hannah knows she's yeah. not hungry before like she we, we put her down in a different room for maybe like five minutes Hannah knew she was like she was like I gotta go check on her and like a few seconds later she started making noises is that is yeah. that that connection is, is is so it's so incredible and Hannah's just over the moon just sitting there and looking at her like not doing anything awesome. with it and looking and singing or whatever yeah else. yeah it's, so yeah, it's fun I mean it keeps in my experience it keeps getting more fun as um like as he basically every, well, at the beginning, it takes a few months at first. I forget at what month he's like, starts smiling when you walk in the room. Cause yeah, right, yeah. But think, that's I like, like, I think it's like three or six. I can't remember. Something like yeah. That. Some, like, someone, remember. somewhere in there. But then after, yeah, after that, like every month is, it just gets more and more fun because you can have more of a, well, they just become more and more of a, a person. Yeah, yeah. And you get to do more with them. How, how are you doing education? He's in a, I mean, he's in a preschool. That's more like, I mean, it's, you know, it's daycare basically. I, he, he actually, he's a, he's a big nerd like me. And so oh, yeah. he's actually, there's actually, there are these shows on, I think they're from BBC, maybe um, number blocks and alpha blocks that he just like happened upon. Yeah. And he, he's so far ahead and he just loves to do math and to read because of those shows. They were excellent. So, cool. um, so like we haven't, uh, my kind of belief is that at this stage, um, I don't think it's important to like that he learn, that he be learning academics right now. Um, but if he wants to, that's cool. Um, I don't know. I don't really like, I, I want to, be searching for schools for when he's a little bit older because I, the one he's at is more academic than I would like. Mm -hmm. um, Do you think like Montessori school or Waldorf? Yeah, yeah, I think I would prefer that. Um, I mean, I think I struggle sometimes because I think, I mean, I, that's almost definitely what I want to do, and and I don't think we're gonna consider like homeschooling, but I think he would learn the most, uh, being homeschooled. But for me, if he's like me, which he kind of seems to be so far, I, th I think his, like, I'm less concerned with how great his education is and more like with this, the social aspect. And I worry that like, I, I want him to be socializing and getting used to other people a lot. Yeah, it's, it's so important, and we're we're gonna go homeschool very very likely, um. But yeah, it's the biggest thing that we're talking about is like how how to help. How, that's my biggest fear. Yeah, with that. Yeah, and so we're we're planning on finding 
communities and clubs or whatever else yeah. like just meetups where people bring their children and, and everything like that uh yeah. and it's probably going to help us socialize because uh, we're, yeah. we're not most social creatures <laughs> yeah uh, that's cool man it, it's so it's so nice to see all these sides of you like you're, you're, you're such a multifaceted person and uh i can tell you've just thought about so much um and i i i hope that when people look at you, they they don't just see a poker player. You know, it's quite it's quite an easy thing, quite an easy trap to fall into a heuristic. Like, okay, this is Phil Gaffon, the poker player. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I feel like I could I could speak to you about absolutely almost any topic, and yet you'd, you'd at least have some thought provoking thing to to be able to add to the conversation. Maybe I did. I mean, I did focus on just poker for a long time, so I'm not I'm not, I'm not too <laughs> educated in other areas. But I but I like to think. And then maybe last question. What what are, if any, some of the long term future goals for, for Phil G? That's a great question. I don't uh I don't really know. I would like to I guess I would like to one day get into teaching outside of poker. Um I'd like to write a book outside of poker. Not that I've written a poker book yet, um, but I think uh, kind of the, what I've done through poker in, like, I think my strength in poker is, is teaching advanced concepts so that most people can understand. And I think I would like to, I'd really like to do that in just the kind of general world and, and be teaching. I, I think that a big problem that we have in the world is that uh, the overwhelming majority of people don't know how to think logically. Um, and I, I would like to, and so many, so many concepts like, uh, you know, you talk about Bayesian probability, you know, overwhelming majority of the world doesn't understand that, but could understand it. You don't have to get into the, like the nitty gritty of it. You just have to understand the concepts. And I think, uh, that's just one example, but I'd like to, teach the average person to understand some, some kind of give some, give them some tools to, to think through things. Have you got the idea of what the book would look like or be called or anything like that? I mean, no, not neither of those, but I, I mean, I, I have an idea of some of the things it goes through, but no, it's a long way from completion. <laughs> Cool. Yeah, I've got I've got a few book ideas that are floating around in my head as well that I feel yeah. probably not even close to starting yet, but I I feel like at some point in my life I'm going to be wise enough to to write the things that I can feel the uh, the ideas. You know? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I for me it's it's time. I feel like I, I mean I had that book idea when I was 22. Yeah. Um, 38. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so. Like, <laughs> I just, uh, I still feel too busy. So I don't know one day. <laughs> do you have, um, do you have ambitions of maybe going into business or charity or anything like that? I don't honestly. So I think a lot of people see me as, um, I don't know, uh, thoughtful, analytical, but I'm, I'm actually very, um, I don't know the worst excitable passion driven like i i, I want to do something different every year like or every <laughs> few months i'm like i have a great idea i want to do this now yeah, yeah, I know that so happened. i don't i don't um i know not to not to think uh 10 years out i guess because i know that i'm gonna have a new passion um at several points between now and then it's probably a wise way of doing it yeah i i, I have a similar thing like I, I used to have so many projects that I think I'll do them all. I think I will at least make most of them. Um, but you can't just do them all at once. And I, I, you can't. I, I, I used we to struggled do. in business because we tried to do too much at once because it's just too fun. But uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah like, the ideas part of it is the most fun part for me. Yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah, and I, I realized, so for, for me, the charity is the, the main thing for me. Like it doesn't have to be in the form of literally making a charity, which I have set up a charity that's ready to launch when I'm ready. Um, yeah. but 
And I really think it's going to be powerful. But at the same time, it, charity could be through political you know, things. It could be through a business that then, you know, eventually donates or creates a structure. Yeah. Um, like I, I, I've got etched out the plans for a more ethical Amazon.com. And I realized, you know, when I, I, I came up with it, I had a team, I spent hundreds of K on it. And I realized that before I could press go, I, I needed to be a better person. I needed to be more competent. I needed to turn up to stuff on time. I needed to not be so sloppy with money. I needed to be more emotionally stable. And so I, I put things on hold. And this charity that I've, I, another one that I've got to tackle homelessness, it's a really cool idea. We've got a really cool team. And I've spent the last two and a half years on it. And again, hundreds of K on this one as well. And it's ready, it's ready to go whenever I'm ready. And it's just like, I'm, I'm, I'm almost, I'm so close to being ready for this one. You know? With either of those things, do you think there's a chance that you're just rationalizing, rationalizing your fear? No, it's the other way around. Uh, yeah. I always try and go before I'm ready and, yeah. you know, talking spiritually for a second, something blocks me. Something just goes wrong. It's like some, some, some lawyer, some legal thing falls apart. Uh, somebody, uh, in the in the company and just quits and then everything falls apart or the the tech to fucking dealing with tech people man uh, yeah. Some of them are <laughs> <shocked>. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when you find a good one it's amazing but when yeah. there's so many agencies out there they've just i even the good ones they took advantage of me um and there's just been something blocking me and blocking me and blocking me every single time and and from my spiritual perspective that that there's there's meaning to that and maybe it's like a psychological pattern playing itself out or something like that but I, i've always wanted to go before i'm ready um and i've yeah i've just been raring to go um, and i'm my lesson has been patience it's been understanding that there's there's certain timing for things and not thinking with my head and thinking with my heart to, to feel when it's right and um yeah yeah like the, I just, yeah no i hear you and that makes sense i just invite you to consider that you can start when you're not ready. And that's how you learn. That's how you improve is, is from experience and, and failing sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I feel you. And that's what I was trying to do for set for, for a really long time. Um, but for, for instance, I just launched a project, uh, like my epiphany and it involved many moving parts. Uh, you know, involved a discord that had been had to train training staff and then we, there was a lot of back-end development then yeah. there's me interacting with the the discord then there's the youtube and the marketing we still haven't got around to a, a lot of the marketing stuff because we're still trying to make the product really really powerfully good and uh worth it for everybody then there's the affiliate system and there's uh, various other things yeah. and there were just so many things that the ceo that we call him dr carbon because he likes to stay in Dr. Carbon brought to my attention when it came to launching. Like um, we launched on the day of the launch, one of the payment providers just stopped working. And sometimes he says he's been in businesses where that would put, put a company back a week. And he was like, well, luckily I put five in just in case, uh, you know, I didn't just have Stripe at this and this and this and this, just in case this happened. And there are so many things like that, where it's like, if I'd launched Thrive, my, the charity, it was so much more multifaceted than this. I would have been screwed. Honestly, I, I was biting off more than, and I, I'm very glad that I, I, I tried to launch and I'm very glad it didn't, it didn't work. Yeah. So you launched some, you're learning from this launch then. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And, and also gain, gaining capital because, uh, yes. it's, it's nice to have passive income when you're trying to give away all your money, which I found <laughs> yeah. quite expensive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. Fuck it. That was beautiful, man. Um, I had fun. Yeah. Uh, it was like three hours of conversation. So uh, thank you for your time. You seem like yeah. uh, you have very valuable time. Well, thank you. My, my pleasure. I enjoyed it. Thanks for the conversation. Cool. All right. Bye, everyone. Peace.